you know, folks don't want to worship God like that. Especially we live in a world today where um, so much is pulling folks um, away from God. There's so much distraction. So God desires our, God has designed our attention. God has designed relationship with him. God has designed worship and God has designed us to give him, give him our best. But when I say give him our best, it's not just about tangible things. God wants to use us. Yes, of course, God wants us to present and and be able to support those in need, support the local congregations. But also God wants to use us. God want God want us to, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Welcome to the Call by God podcast with Adney Godet and myself, Nixon Sylvain. This show is about dialogues of biblical characters and testimonies of Christians who submitted to the will of God. Each week, we bring on one guest so that they can share their story of how they were called by God. I hope this show inspires you. Enjoy. All right. Hello and welcome, world, to the Call by God podcast. I'm yours truly, Brother Nick, and I'm here with Sister Adney Godin. Sister Godin, how are you doing on this blessed day? I am amazing, Brother Nick. I honestly, I can't complain. Um, I took some time to sit in silence. Um, I need to finish the book. So I needed to take some time to just sit at the feet of Jesus and sit in some silence and, um, you know, get let out the noise of work and doing the day to day things to um, just sit at his feet. And it's, it's so amazing that <laughs> sitting at his feet, we're having a discussion about him. So I think that that's the most powerful and fulfilling part about it. How are you doing? I am blessed. I can't even complain. Kind of like what you said, you know, whenever anyone or any saint have an opportunity to, to, to talk about Jesus Christ, it is uh, definitely a blessing. It's it's also humbling, you know, especially when you when you come to the knowledge and you understand what the Savior did for you and did for me and did for the what he did for the world. It is humbling. I, I think I think who that was who that was that got crucified upside down that because he wasn't even even worried. Peter. It was Peter. Because he wasn't even worthy to be crucified as his Lord. So um, I take the same disposition. It is a humbling uh, position um, to um, just to talk about our, our Savior. And just to, it's like we're, it's like we're going back. It's, all, it's a bittersweet moment. Because you, you see the things that he went through. But when you, when you the, celebrate, the celebratory moment, when we celebrate, is when he rose on the third day, right? We didn't get to that episode yet. <laughs> That's when we get to, to, to celebrate when he rose. And then not only that, we have salvation in him. So um, it is uh, definitely a blessing to talk about the Lord. But I want to dive right into it. And so this episode is, is special. Uh, I mean, all the episodes are special, but, but we read about the prophecies uh, in episode one, we talked about Deuteronomy 18. Uh, we talked about Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah uh, 53, 1 through 12. And that's when you had, a, ooh, Adam, you almost broke down uh, when you read that that passage. I had a moment as well. I had a speechless moment after you read that. And we also talked about Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. But, Annie, I don't know if you're a big fan of, of baby showers. <laughs> you know when a woman about to give birth, folks be excited now. Well, some people be excited. Some, right? Some, some, you know, some husbands, they be like, another one? That's, they say they, they call that the oops baby. That's the oops baby. Oops. <laughs> but children are a blessing. Children are definitely a blessing. Um, that's one of the things that God told Adam and Eve to do, to, to be fruitful and, and multiply. And I like how you pointed that out in episode number one, being fruitful is not only predicated on just having children, but it's just pretty much is about everything because God is about life. Anything that's dead, that's, that's not of God. Dead, that's, that's not of God. It's just that 
we have all have to suffer death because of the consequences of, of, of the fall of humanity. But still, when Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ is like a reminder that death is not the end because Jesus Christ stared death right in his face. Say, you can't hold me down. So the same spirit that raised up Christ, that's the same spirit that will raise us up, raise us up in the last day. So I'm thankful for this episode. So this episode, we're going to be talking about baby Jesus. Baby Jesus from when he was a baby until when he was 12 years old. So we talked about the prophecy. So now the prophecy is coming into fruition. You, you've never been in a position where God mentioned something to you and then later you start to see it come to pass. You'd be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. Um, you told me this. You told me that I was going to do this um, way back over there yonder. And now I could see it come in the past. So now we got the ball rolling. So all the Old Testament, you know, God was preparing a way for the Son of God to come onto earth. So this is what we're going to read. So in Luke chapter 1. Verse 30 through 31. Addie, Addie, what version Bible are you reading today? I have the NLT up. The NLT? Okay, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so so uh, go ahead and read it. So uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through uh, 31. Go ahead. And it reads, Don't be afraid. It says, Don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Amen. So when I read passages like this, right, because um, my mind, I, I like to I like to visualize things. I try to picture things in my mind. Imagine you have a heavenly being. <laughs> the Bible describes this is an angel, an angel, a messenger, a messenger from God. Imagine if you have a heavenly being at so you're a woman, right? You're 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 a virgin woman, and a a, a a a heavenly being walk up to you and said to fear not. You know, us folks, when we see things unnatural, we we kind of we <laughs> we we shake, we shake out of our boots, like because that's not normal to the human, that's not natural to the human eye. So when we see uh, this is an angel, a heavenly being. Um, from heaven, came down and told Mary to fear not. And he said, God has found favor with you. You know, the last time that I, I, I heard favor and grace, that was through Noah, when before God destroyed um, the earth, you know, that was the same thing. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and then God spared Noah and his family. So when God looked down at, you know, because you know God, God sits high and he looks low. So when God, you know, God is all powerful. He's everywhere, all knowing. He's just omnipotent. He's everywhere, all powerful, omniscient. Um, he's he's uh, sovereign, and he's omnipresent everywhere. But we know he's a God. He sits high, and he look low. When God sits high and he look low at Mary, Mary found favor. In God's sight. And I say to myself, what's so special about Mary? I think you said it before. I think um, we, could, we, we did an episode about Mary. Um, Mary, I don't know if we, did we do an episode about Mary? Yeah. We sure okay. did. Yeah, so we did an episode about Mary. So uh, you said that Mary was called to carry Jesus. That's a blessing. Because, you know, <laughs> that's a blessing. When God created you to create, to, to carry him, God created you to carry him. <laughs> that's amazing, right? That's, that's, some, that's some amazing stuff right there. So in, in, in verse 31, he says, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. He didn't say a girl. He gave a specific instruction. He said, he said you're going to bring forth a son, and you shall call him Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is this is the mir this is the the miracle within itself cuz we going we we know what the angel said. But we are going to talk about the miracle. The miracle is found in Luke 135 
uh, in Matthew and in Matthew 1, 18. Now, Addy, before we talk about the miracle, this anything you got to say about how the angel appeared to Mary? Because you're a female. Because, you know, when, okay, God, God talked to us through his word now. So God, you know, yeah, God t- could talk to us through dreams. God could talk to us through his word. But I know that God is all powerful too. God is so, he's so unique. He, God will catch humans off guard. Whenever we try to put God in a, in a box, God would do the supernatural, right? Because some people will say, oh, God don't do that no more. Yeah, I, I said it. Some people will put God in a box and they'll say, nah, God, nah, God is just in a box. He's, they, they not going to say that, that he's in a box. But that's pretty much what they're putting them in. They, they trying to limit the power of God. So a supernatural being, Mary got a revelation from God, found favor in God's sight. What are your thoughts on that from a woman perspective? I, I see the honor in this angel coming to Mary. Like I said in, in, in the previous uh, uh, recording, God knows our heart. And, and, and you just said it. God knew how he created Mary. God knew the heart that Mary had to think, because think about, she had to be at at least age 13, 14. You know, these teenagers nowadays, they doing all this reckless stuff. And, and you thinking about a 13 year old young woman who found favor in the sight of God. I think that is so powerful. Why? Because teenagers are rebellious. Teenagers don't want to do what their parents tell them to do because they know what's best. But here it is. Mary finds favor in the sight of God. Her heart must have been so pure. She must have been one of those most obedient children to her parents. You understand what I'm saying? Like when her parents talk, yes, mom, or, or, you know, um, I don't I don't know the Hebrew term, but I know father probably, you know, yeah, Abba, you know, uh, whatever you say, I'll do. And even and even when when the angel, you know, lets her know that this is going to happen, her response to it was whatever the Lord says, I am his servant. So she had a servant's heart. She knew um, that God chose her for something so special. It's not that she was special. It was the assignment that he placed upon her that was special. And that was carrying the, the savior of the world, the Messiah, the Mashiach. Right. Um, and I think that's extremely powerful because how many of us will God send an angel to come and talk to us and say, hey, I have this specific assignment for you. A lot of us got to be like, yo, uh, I guess I'm going to have to look for somebody else, <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and that's that's what comes to mind. And as a woman, for me, I, I had my first child at 14 and I was scared, scared, like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? But she accepts the fact that God chose her to carry his son. And she just says, I'm, I'm your humble servant. Let it be unto me. And I think that's the heart and the attitude and the posture every single Christian must have when it comes to an assignment that God gives them. Is I'm your hu- hu- humble servant. Let it be unto me. The, the thing is, I, I think that God knows us. God knows his children. Kind of like what I said in the first episode. We know our children. We, we, know, the, <laughs> we know the child that's going to give us a hard time. You'd be like, yep, that one right there. Mm, yep. You know what I mean? So we know our children, and that's the same way that God is. You know, God knows us. God knows each and every one of his children. He knows what we can handle and what we cannot. He knows what we're capable of doing, although some of us don't know what we're capable of doing. Some people belittle themselves like they're not capable of doing anything. But God knows us, and that's not normal. So that's why when, when I think about what God did, with uh, Mary, um, he had that same sight, that same favor with Noah, you know, because this this was a time, this was a trying time in Noah's time where people thought about evil continuously. But yet he found favor with Noah and his family. And Noah had that call to build the ark. Noah had the call to build the ark and then Noah followed through. And it wasn't a small task. I just put it this way, that any task that God give us is not small. It, it is it is um it is one of those things. It's intimidating because we could read through history 
of the Bible where, where individuals that had cause, um, they were intimidated, but yet they, they, they trusted in God enough to follow through on that call and even with their purpose. Moses, Moses said what? Well, he had a speech impediment. He, he stutters, right? You know, and um, Jonah, Jonah didn't want to go out there and tell them people to repent. Jonah, <laughs> Jonah went on a cruise ship. <laughs> Jonah, so, you know, the, the call, whenever God call us um, that task or whatever the purpose is, it's huge. It's huge beyond our, even our imagination. So I think he, I believe he chose the perfect vessel for it in, in Mary. So this is where the miracle kicks in. Um, Adney, you could read it in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 35, and then you could transition over to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18. Luke chapter 1, verses 35 says, The angel answered, and I'm in the message, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest hovers over you. Therefore, the child you bring to, you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. And of course, this is the angel answering to like Mary's question, like, okay, so you said I'm going to get pregnant, but how does going to happen? I'm a virgin, right? <laughs> like, I don't know what you're talking about because I ain't never been with a man. And then in eight, uh, Matthew 1, 18, it says, the birth of Jesus took place like this. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph before they came to the to the marriage bed, Joseph discovered she was pregnant. It was by the Holy Spirit, but he didn't know that. So that's that's what I wanted to highlight is that, number one, she got pregnant by the way of the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not something that, that we can in our human mind could comprehend. We can't. So when we talk about God parted the Red Sea, God opened up the Jordan River, uh, when Jesus came, he was healing the blind and healing the sick, the deaf, the lame, um, seeing folks being miraculously healed, people that was demon possessed being healed. And even to this day, you know, God could do wonders. But to us is is in our human mind, we can't we can't contain that. It is it's so deeper than we think. So when we say see that God is using a vessel as Mary, a virgin. So, so virgins are pure. Uh, I'm going to repeat that again. If you're a virgin, keep yourself. Virgins are pure. They are pure. It's a reason why God want folks to wait until they get married. So virgins are pure. So God used a pure vessel that haven't been touched and impregnated impregnated her by way of the Holy Spirit. So this is what the angel told her, and it actually came to pass in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. So in Matthew verses 1, 18 says, and on following all the way down, it says, now the birth of Jesus was on the wise when as, um, as his mother Mary was in spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she found with child of the Holy Spirit. So now she's together with Joseph, and she pregnant. Now, we did a whole episode about Joseph. I, I am not going to talk about Joseph. <laughs> I, we talked about Joseph. Y'all have to just go back and listen to the episode on all the platforms, um, all the media platforms, podcasts, Spotify, whatever, Apple Podcasts, rather. But um, Adney, she's, she is pregnant with the Holy Spirit. You said... You said something so profound, um, and I want to interject here because a lot of times, just be per just because a person is not sexually active does not necessarily make them pure, right? Because they could be doing other stuff, reading books that are contaminating their minds, doing things to themselves. So when we think about being a virgin, it is literally consuming the word of God. It is feeding your spirit and not your flesh. It is not reading Zane. It's not reading Mary B. Morrison. It's not looking at porn. It is really allowing the word of God to, to keep you in a state and a mind of purity. Um, because you could, you could 
still be a virgin and still be contaminated. You understand what I'm saying? Because I, I was reading this book and this young woman, her thing was reading uh, romance novels. Never had sex, but she was doing things for to herself. And that's the thing that people have to understand when you think about purity. Mary was so pure. She was pure in heart and she was pure in mind. She was chosen as this vessel to carry Jesus because of the purity of her heart and mind. Um, and, and that's what I would say to a virgin. If you're going to if you're going to keep your virginity, keep it. And that means not reading the filthy stuff, not engaging in, in self-gratification, but realizing that there is a purpose and a plan that God has for you. And when God, you know, brings forth the spouse that he has for you, then you can enjoy that thing, that 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 intimacy between you and that person. That's number one. Number two, so Holy Spirit just literally placed this on my heart while you were talking is how Jesus is pure. Jesus doesn't have uh, the, the man's uh, semen and the mother's egg. It's like God did that thing, right? So in the purest form, Jesus enters into Mary's womb. There was no man interaction in that pregnancy. It was all God. That was all God, like deity coming inside of a human being. It was not her eggs. It was not, you know, just, it was God, all God. And I, 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 ooh, it's like when you think about the holies of holies, Mary, um, Mary's purity, it just shows that there was something about her, like, like I said, when you think of the holies of holies, her womb was acceptable to carry the baby Jesus. There was something about her. And that's what that's how we have to look at our assignments. There is something about us that God chose us for these specific assignments. They're heavy. They're uncomfortable. They're big. But he chose us to bear and carry these assignments. The goal, the key is to say, here in my Lord, send me. And that's 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 what I was thinking about when you were talking. No, uh, that's that's profound. And even to validate uh, what you you just said. So in Matthews one twenty five said that her uh, husband, uh, Joseph, he said, and and it, this is what it said about Joseph. So let me go to verse twenty four and twenty five. It says, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and he took unto him his wife and knew her not. He didn't even touch her. He knew her not till she had brought forth her first son and called his name Jesus. So that <laughs> y'all just got to have to go back and listen to that Joseph episode. This was his wife and he, he, he didn't even, you know what husband and wife do, right? <laughs> Husband and wives, you get married, you go into, you know, American way, you going to go to a honeymoon and, you know, right? Dude didn't even, dude didn't even touch her. He said, nah, because God revealed it to him. God revealed it to him that what is in her is from him. It's not from another dude. <laughs> not from another dude. Don't get it twisted. It ain't from another dude. She wasn't going around doing, doing the dude. She, uh-uh. This is from me. And that's powerful because we're talking about baby Jesus, right? So baby Jesus is in Mary's womb. So picture this, right? God is in a human's womb. Baby Jesus was 100% flesh, human, baby, and God at the same time in Mary's womb. How about that? How you see how God, you see how God is so all powerful, all knowing, all sight that he could do whatever he wants. God says through prophecy that I'm going to come here on earth through my son and I'm going to be a baby. A baby. And you know I I like how we're talking about baby Jesus because God being born as a human 
he had to experience humanity from all phases of life. God can God is God could have just said, "You know what? I'm going to go ahead and redeem humanity. I'm just going to appear as a human." Then people would have been saying, they were like, "Well, God, you only been here as an adult. You you don't know how it, how it feels to be a teenager. You don't know how it feels to be in elementary school. You don't know how it feels to be in high school." But God came as a baby because he wanted to experience all of humanity. See, because when, when folks are old, God give us, God give us longevity because he's hoping you'll get it to that point. He's hoping by the time you're born, by the time you're you're 10 years old or 12 or 16, 18, 20 to 30, that you'll get it. So when you're old, you you you're supposed to have gained a little wisdom by then. You're supposed to come to the knowledge of Christ. Being here on earth for that long, you trying to tell me you people been talking to you about Jesus Christ and you missed it all along. Jesus Christ. He could have just appeared at the age of 30 and say, here, I'm the king and I'm here, I'm your savior and I'm here to redeem all of humanity. But God, through his sovereignty, he understands the little ones. He understands the ones that are babies, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-years-old. Oh, Addie, let me even go back because you have a butterfly kisses ministry. He understands when parents are pregnant, they want to commit abortion. He understands that. Because guess what? Joseph could have said, hey, you know, this ain't mine. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. So God is so sovereign that he he goes back into the womb. That's why we believe that life is, it starts in the womb. Life, any inkling of life, Right? Whenever a woman, <laughs> that's, that's where life begins. So Jesus Christ understands that process from when you're in your mother's womb to you're a little baby to you're a, a young boy to you're a teenager to you're a young adult until you're 30. And God is hoping through his sovereignty that you get it. When you think about talking to people, sometimes you'll hear them say, you can't tell me anything until you've walked a mile in my shoes, right? Jesus is the perfect example of walking a mile in man's shoes. The only difference is he didn't sin. He didn't let the cares of life get to him. He knew he was about his father's business and he stayed the course. He didn't allow nothing to distract him. He didn't allow nothing to to sway him. He ain't like he ain't allow no woman to get into his ear. He he look. I'm here about my daddy's business. Like all of this foolishness that y'all got going on ain't got nothing to do with me. I'm here to fulfill his plan. So I'm gonna reiterate. Even for me, even for you, we all have an assignment. We got to get to the point where we are like Jesus, and we say, I'm about my father's business. I'm about that assignment that God has given me. Um, It may be heavy, but sometimes you just got to get into the trenches, get on your knees. In the words of Yolandi, your knees need to get ashy and stay on your knees (laughs) and, and pray and fast and ask God to help you because Sometimes you can be pregnant and that pregnancy, and and I'm speaking in a metaphorical metaphorical term, and that is to say you can be pregnant with a purpose and it's breached and you need God to spiritually go and turn that pregnancy around so that you can push what he's given you out, right? Mary's baby wasn't breached. Mary's baby was healthy. Mary's, um, and, and I love that song that says, Mary, did you know? Like, Sometimes we got to understand there is a purpose that God chooses us for that supersedes our own comprehension and understanding. And to know that Jesus walked where we walked. Jesus was tested with all the things we were tested with. Jesus was tempted with the things that we are we were uh, we are tempted with. So when a person asks you the question, like, did you walk a mile in my shoes? No, I didn't. But Jesus did. (laughs) Right. Jesus did. You're not going through nothing that Jesus has not encountered. And that's the reason the redemption story is so beautiful. We are a part of the greatest story of all time. And that is man being redeemed to God. And and that to me is the beautiful, the most beautiful story we can ever be a part of. So now we're, now we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus. So Adney, this is where, I mean, it's exciting. You know, it was exciting for me. Um, and 
episode one, when God already made a plan for humanity. But I think I said on the top of this episode, uh, you know, they probably went through their baby shower. <laughs> That's how we do it in modern term. We like when folks having a baby, you got to have a baby shower, <laughs> and you got to do the baby. I think the baby reveal is something new. Is it going to be a boy and a girl? <laughs> but Mary already knew that she would have a son because it was told, "Hey, you're going to have a son, and you're going to name him uh, Jesus." So Mary already got her her sky blue. Um, what they call that? Uh, baby, baby reveal. <laughs> she got early baby reveal. She was going to have a son, baby Jesus. So in uh, Matthew chapter uh, chapter two, verse one, uh, what does your Bible say? Annie? Okay, so the NLT reads: Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem. Asking, I got to go to verse two. Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw the star in as it as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Wow! So, people, folks, Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. That is important. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and you I, I, you see how I highlight in the days of Herod the king. Because that's important, too. That's important, too. Because we're we going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that just briefly. So, Adney, I, I like how you pointed out, you you immediately went into verse number two about the the wise men, right? The the wise men. They call them the, the magis, the, the wise men. So, continue reading that. I'm not, Continue reading that in uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. We're going to see what the wise men did. Because if the Bible had the, the wise men in there for... If the Bible has the wise men in there, it's for a reason. Okay, it's for a reason. Go ahead, Ed. Verse 9 reads, After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures, their treasure chest, and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They worshiped. They worshiped. They worshiped him. Yes. And so when we say worship, y'all, we're talking about someone or something that a person shows reverence and adoration to, appropriate to pretty much a deity, like such as God. Um, You know, there are people that worship false gods. There are people, little g gods, people worship their idols and things. But these magis, I think I said this in the past, the magis had to have some insight for them to see the star, and to know where God, baby God, baby God, (laughs) baby Jesus was located at and worshiped him. They, man, I don't know. I'm just, because the thing is, we worship God, right? Um, I don't know. You know, we don't worship God only one day out of the week. Some people think that um, people go to a church to, to sing to God or worship. No, we worship God. Seven days a week. Your worship to God has to be seven days a week. So these magis worship and also they presented gifts. They gave their best to God. Don't you see? So let let me share with you how powerful this is, right, Adney? You remember during the fall of man, um, so God wanted Cain and Abel to present sacrifices uh, before him. Abel gave his best. Cain kind of like gave God whatever, whatever. And we see here how the, the paradigm, everything is shifting now when it comes to worship now. These magis are, are, are is an, an example of how God desires worship. 
and they came before, and he's a baby too. He's a baby. This is baby Jesus. But at the same time, he's not just a baby. He's Jesus. And we talked about it in episode one. He is God. So I said all that to say this, that when it comes to worshiping God, and I know we see here the Magi's, we got to worship God and we got we to give God our best. Not the leftovers. Not, not, what, not what we see happen with uh, Cain back in the book of Genesis. Give God whatever. And that's where most people get in trouble, Sister Adney, because number one, don't, you know, folks don't want to worship God like that. Especially we live in a world today where um, so much is pulling folks um, away from God. There's so much distraction. So God desires our, God has designed our attention. God has designed relationship with him. God has designed worship and God is designed us to give him, give him our best. But when I say give him our best, it's not just about tangible things. God wants to use us. Yes, of course, God wants us to present and, and be able to support those in need, support the local congregations, but also God wants to use us. God want God want us to, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto him. So when we think about worship, no, this is not like, oh, I went to church today. Um, after church, um, I went to grandmama house and I had Sunday, what do they call that? Sunday dinner, Sunday lunch. <laughs> I had Sunday lunch. No, 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 no. God want to see what you're going to do on Monday. Are you going to worship him and present the best to him? God going to see what, you, what you're going to do on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. And even Friday. So God want to see if we're going to worship him throughout the week. Because like I said, um, as I alluded to earlier, um, there are so many things that's striving to pull people away from God. Social media, the news, the wars that's going on, our jobs, and even family, y'all. Even family. But God is desiring to have relationship with us. And that's why I like how um, and I'm not going to go into in depth of the Magi's, but I like how the author pointed out the Magi's, how they seen, they seen a sign. They seen a sign. And I, I believe that they had some insight, but they seen a sign and they knew where baby Jesus was and they worship. I don't think people understand what I'm saying. They, they worship because some people could worship their cars. Addy, I don't seen folks get a brand new car, uh, idolize and worship their cars or whatever. It could be whatever. It could be a home, whatever the case may be. But for, the, for this example, I'm just going to use a car. I don't see, see folks just get nice, good, good cars too. Look good, clean cars. And they just idolize it. Like as though they're worshiping it. They clean it. I'd be like, dude, you just cleaned it yesterday. Now I got to clean it again. Like, oh man, this is my baby. I believe that's what the Magi's, that's what they did to baby Jesus. They honored, they worshiped him. Because we could, we could, the way that most of us could understand that, especially if you're carnally minded, is the things that are people, the people that carnally minded do already with the things that they have, such as a car or a home, even jobs. People could honor and worship their bosses, their jobs, then worship God. So I like how the manage, the Magi's were highlighted uh, in this past. Um, when I think of worship, um, I think of our breath. Our breath is a form of worship because the moment we get up, if we are truly in tune with God, the first thing we do is praise and worship God and thank him for giving us another opportunity. When I think of worship, I think of our posture, the way we submit ourselves before our father, before our big brother, and even the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. When I think of worship, I think of our hearts and how in tuned and aligned we are with God. Because to worship God, like you said, is seven days, seven days of a week, 365 days, 
52 weeks, right? We have to understand that it's an everyday process. And we're not going to always get it right. When these men came to worship, they didn't worship Mary. They worshiped Jesus. And they went to Bethlehem to find where baby Jesus is at. So as I was doing some research for our recording, I wanted to understand some things and to bring some things to light. Many people look at the birth of Jesus as Christmas. First and foremost, if we do our research, birthing takes place in the springtime because that's when you see the baby lambs and all these different things. Jesus was not born in December. We got to really do our research and look at that, right? So to know that springtime, like God is so strategic, right? He, 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 the sun comes in the era of birthing, which is spring. Spring represents new life, new beginning. Like our father is so strategic, man. Like when I tell you, I'm every time, like I look at and read and see, it's like, wow. To, to, to bring the Messiah in a new era, a new beginning, a new life. Like this is what it's all about. And then the place where he is born is known as the house of bread. Bethlehem is known as the house of bread. And of course, we're going to discuss this, but Jesus is known as what? The bread of life. We take for granted the things that the Lord affords us to see when we start reading his word and really studying his word and desiring to know more. And to know that this innocent child came into the world to incite change and start something afresh. Jesus, you want to talk about revolutionary? Jesus is the epitome of a revolutionary. He, re- he revolutionized the mindset of so many people that were stuck in bondage to the law of Moses to help them see this is what it is. This is what true love is not following the law of Moses. True love is being in alignment and surrenderance to God and God alone. Like you said, people buying cars, not realizing you can get into an accident. And there goes the car that you were idolizing. People idolize marriage. So you get married and your husband or your wife gets sick and they get cancer and then they die. There goes your, there goes your idol, right? Sometimes we need to understand, we need to put God in the place where God needs to be. We idolized Michael Jackson for years and it took a man with some medicine to literally put him to sleep and he never woke up. People are idolizing Beyonce. Like we have to understand there is only one person that we must worship. And that is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Through Christ Jesus, do we have eternal life? And, and that's, um, that's what, what I really wanted to focus on. And I wanted to let people know, stop calling Christmas Christ's birthday. That is not his birthday. It's just a season for you to go and spend a whole lot of money and put yourself in debt. There is no God on this green earth that's going to create a season where you're putting yourself in debt. Now you becoming a slave to the to the to the um, lender. Get we need to get our minds right. We really, truly need to get our minds right and understand that God is a God of love and not a God of bondage. Amen. No, I, that was a good take. So we're we're just gonna continue to tiptoe on Jesus' uh, young adult baby, young adult stages. So real quick, I want to talk about how baby Jesus was in danger. So we knew what was going on. Yeah, the the Magi's got insight, but also there's a spiritual part of it too, because baby Jesus was in danger. Herod, Herod desired to kill all the the two-year-olds, young and um, two years old and younger. And baby Jesus was included in that number. So uh, apparently God in his wisdom 
And Adney, you could read it in Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 13 through 15, because uh, <laughs> Jesus' mom and dad, baby Jesus, had to flee and go somewhere else because of him. Okay, so I'm going to start at 12, because it says, when it came, when when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. 13, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The um, angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys and uh, in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her, her, um, Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted for they are dead. It's So this is not the first time that this has happened before. We know uh, back in Moses' time um, that this occurred as well. Baby Moses, um, there was a time that babies were being killed too back in Moses' day. And Moses was put in a, in a, in a basket. <laughs> so uh, this has happened before. So Moses... It's like a, a type shadow of Christ. So Moses and Jesus Christ's life are, are somewhat parallel. But Moses was just a man. But Jesus, it's just like God, you know what God was doing? That's why I love what God was doing. So when we read the Old Testament, the Old Testament is like a preview. You know, it's not the full picture. It's like a preview. It's like God was giving us snapshots. You ever seen a pre a movie? You know how they, they always get us all the time on television. They say, hey, you want to see this movie? They show us the good parts, the preview. You be like, man, I, I got to go watch this movie. This movie look real good. And you, try, you call your family, hey, man, we got to go watch this movie. So that's what God was doing. So in the Old Testament, God was giving us a preview. So when you talk about, when we read about Moses, and we talked about Moses and the Ten Commandments, the children of Israel. Yeah, God used the children of Israel, the Israelites, because that that's, that's the genealogy, which is Judah. Jesus will come through the lineage of Judah. But Jesus Christ will come through the lineage of Judah for the sake for the whole world. But back then, it was limited to um, for, um, sojourners. Uh, well, we know the people of God was the Israelites. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then a Jacob's name got changed to Israel. Then Jacob had the 12 sons, and that's where you get the Israelites. And then, of course, they had the land. So we know that Jesus Christ come from the lineage of Judah, but they also were intermingling with other nations. But we know other nations were, um, they worshiped false gods, you know, the people in Atlanta, Canaan, and there's a whole history behind that I'm not going to dive into. But God is so sovereign that God has given us a preview of what's to come. So, so when we fast forward to the New Testament, God is like, I'm not going to only save Israel. I'm not going to only save Jews. I didn't only come for white people. I didn't only come for peach people. I didn't only come for black people. I've come to conquer death and sin. What I came and conquer what has entered into this world. That's why I like how you pointed out in, in episode one, Man, Jesus Christ stared death right in the face. Jesus Christ did what was next. And we're going to get to that. That's, that's an episode four. We're going to get into that. But Jesus Christ died for all. It's not limited to only one set of people. It's for everybody, right? So, but we see here, baby Jesus is in trouble. And this is not the first time. So as a result, it's amazing because Jesus Christ had to flee to Egypt. Ain't that something? Born in Bethlehem. Fled to Egypt, 
Didn't I just talk about that the children were in bondage to the Israelites? And here's Jesus doing the opposite. He's, baby Jesus is going to Egypt. And I'm not even going to talk about the significance of Egypt. But what I do want to say, because we got to talk about when he was 12 years old. <laughs> it's going to skip from this, that. So Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, went to Egypt, and he came back. He went to Nazareth. He returned to Nazareth. So those were Jesus Christ's journeys when he was a baby. Born in Bethlehem, fled to Egypt because of Herod, killing all them little babies, all the little young boys. And then he returned to Nazareth, Nazareth in verse Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. And it says, And he came and he dwelt in the city of Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So now the Bible skips. And again, he lived his young, you know, he's, a, he's in elementary school, y'all. We ain't going to talk about him in elementary school because there's nothing written about him in elementary school. And I'm just putting it like in a modern way. So it skipped from baby Jesus to now here's Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. And Adney, I believe that kids as young as 12, they could comprehend, they could understand the good news, the gospel of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So um, kids should not think that, oh, I'm too young. I, I don't want to know about eternal life. Because here we see a, a depiction, we see a picture here of Jesus Christ. Oh, you know what? Let me not be a spoiler. Adney, go ahead and read <laughs> uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 41 and 52. I know you're going to go ahead and read and we'll just have a conversation about it. All right. I'm reading it in the message. Um It says, every year, Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up as they always did for the feast. When it was over and they left for home, the child Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents didn't know it. Thinking he was was somewhere in the company of of pilgrims, they journeyed for a whole day. And then (laughs) they began looking for him among relatives and neighbors. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem looking for him. The next day they found him in the temple seated among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. The teachers were all quite taken with him, impressed with the sharpness of his answers, but his parents were not impressed. They were upset and hurt. His mother said, young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. He said, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. (laughs) So he went back to Nazareth with them and lived obediently with them. His mother held these things dearly, deep within herself. And Jesus matured, growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by both God and people. Wow. So it's, yeah, ooh, okay. So just, I'm going to just talk about this briefly because I know time is well spent. But baby, well, he's not, I can't call him baby anymore. I was about to say baby Jesus. He's a preteen now. He's a preteen. You know what they say about them preteens, Adney? I remember when I was... Rebellion. Yeah, I remember when I was 12, man. But you know what's crazy? When I was 12, before I, before I even talk about Jesus, let me just talk about this. Before I was 12, that's when I was living with my... Um, no, when I was 12 years old, I was living with my uncle. So when I was 12, that's when I was going to uh, the place... That's when I was going to church faithfully, around that, around that same age. Um, what were you doing around the age of 12, Adney? The age of 12, what was I doing at the age of 12? I was living with my aunt. So I was in an abusive home, honestly, at the age of 12. Um, babysitting other people's children and being abused. <laughs> in all honesty. Yeah. So, so, yeah, preteen Jesus um, was found in the temple. And what I like about 
it's so many things you read that that I could that I could tackle. But the point is that his parents went to Jerusalem to the feast of the Passover, and at twelve years old, he was among those teaching um, the word. In other words, the word he was gravitated by the word. It's the word that that got his attention, and he was there for a few days, uh, three days. He was there for a while. Um, his parents thought they, they would have had to put him on a milk carton, Adney. His parents thought they had to put him on a milk carton. Oh, I'm just trying to put it in modern term, not not to make fun of anybody that's that's missing. Um, may my prayers go to those families that have uh, missing loved ones. But Jesus' parents thought he was missing. But Jesus was found among the leaders asking questions. He was talking. He was in his temple. And um, what really got to me, the interesting point that really got to me is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. Um, When Jesus Christ said, how is it that you sought me? Like, why are you looking for me? He says, wits ye not that I must be about my father's business. So right there at the age of 12, Jesus Christ is trying to convey with his parents that the calling that I have or the purpose that I have, I I must abide by that. It's like he couldn't even control it. He couldn't even control it. So when you have a calling, when you have a purpose, when God has called you to do something, you're going to have that mindset. You're going to be like, look, I'm going to be about my father's business. I got to do whatever it takes in order to fulfill the calling that God has on my life. And here, this is the early stages of Jesus Christ being gravitated towards the word. Because that's the thing. that It's like, it's like a, uh, any, any child of God, Adney. So when we hear... Um, you know, sermons or when we hear music that's godly music, our spirits automatically gravitate to it. So I'm going to give you an example. So if I'm at work and I hear somebody say, Jesus, my antennas go up. I hold up. Who done called Jesus? Automatically, my spirit going to want to gravitate towards that. Or it could be like a sermon or a teaching lesson. My my spirit going to automatically be heightened. And I'm like, man, I want to I wanna engage in that conversation or I want to listen into what's going on in that conversation. So it's in you. It's, it, it's, your, it's the spirit man. Because we don't really know the flesh. But the flesh is the opposition to God. So the flesh wars against the spirit. The flesh does not desire the things of the spirit. So our flesh tells us that we want to do fleshly things. What fleshly things do. But the spirit, because we know that God is spirit, and those that, or them that worship God, must worship God in spirit and the truth, because God is spirit. But we're looking at, Preteen Jesus, which is 100% preteen and 100% God. So it's the spirit in him. It's the God in him that's gravitating towards the godly temple. I think it's beautiful that at the age of 12, he already understood his assignment. And the beauty of understanding that assignment is what he says to his mom. Why were you looking for me? Like, like you already knew this, like the angels told you that you were going to be carrying the son of God. So your expectations for me should not be any different from what the angels revealed to you. So anywhere you're going to look for me, you need to look for me in my father's house. You need to look for me um, sitting at the feet of teachers, wanting to know more, wanting to even impart my wisdom on them because of course the wisdom that he was sharing comes directly from God. Um, and, and that's the thing I want to talk to parents about, um, especially those that are married. Yes. Two parent households are beautiful, but sometimes there's a sacrifice that's going to have to be made on both parts. So that way you can raise your children in the wisdom and admonition of the Lord. Sometimes it's going to take one of the parents to say, hey, you know what, for the next three years, I'm going to have to stay and nurture our child at home while you work. 
right? So that way we can put Jesus in this child because when they go out into the world, the world is going to eat them up and spit them out. Um, and the reason I'm sharing this is because, of course, last month our, our we had two people that we interviewed and both of them were discipled well and they didn't waver on when they made the decision to follow Jesus. They knew when the time was, was right because they were discipled well. They were in love with Jesus before making the decision. Jesus understood the assignment. He was in love with God and knew that I don't care what my mama and my daddy says, I have to follow what my daddy in heaven tells me. But what I love is when it says that he humbled himself and walked in obedience until his adulthood, he had to be in subjection to his parents. So um, as parents, yes, y'all probably saying she crazy, you know, it's expensive out here. But think about your children's maturity in Christ. Because at the end of the day, these old bodies eventually are going to go to the ground and the spirit is going to go back to God. And what you don't want is for a ch- for you to have a child that doesn't reverence or fear God because you didn't put it in him because you were too busy working for the world versus working for God by stewarding your child well. Yeah, that's well said. Um, but... <laughs> Is, but, let, you know, just briefly, I'm going to talk about Mary. So uh, Mary um, even kept all those things in her heart. So when your child says something like that, like, you know, I'm about my father's business and all that good stuff, Mary kept that stuff in her heart. Ain't that something? So I'm going to just close out with that. But the, the Bible did mention that Jesus grew with wisdom and stature and favor and favor with God and man. So that, that's the conclusion of episode two. Um, this episode was definitely a blessing um, to me, and I'm sure it was to you, Adney, and I'm sure our listeners are going to uh, enjoy it. Just remember to continue to let God use you on the God-given assignment that he has you on. Because as we see here, baby, like even the things that we go through as kids, sometimes we don't understand what we go to. You know, I, I got countless of stories of things that I went through when I was young, and now it makes sense. So we see Jesus Christ was in that same danger where Jesus Christ was on the verge of dying. Um, but I know it wasn't going to happen because of God's sovereignty and through God's um, power. But even through it all, Jesus Christ grew. Um, he grew in the wisdom of God and, and, and even being found in the temple. And Adney, I believe that kids has the, the, thor- the, thor- the authority and power to draw their parents closer to God. Um, so even though we, we know that uh, Mary and, and Joseph, that they were right before God, but um, sometimes children can be elevated spiritually and to help their parents to see uh, what they don't see or what they need to see as it relates to God. So um, I believe that children are important. Um, you know, Jesus, Jesus loved the kids. You know, Jesus Christ loved the kids. So remember, world, that Jesus Christ, he is the King of Kings and he's the Lord of Lords. That's it for now. But before we go, please continue to listen, subscribe, and share our podcast. Also, if you want to support our show, please scroll down to the bottom of the show notes and click on the link that says buy me a coffee. We would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And remember, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. And also, Jesus Christ loves you. Thank you. Wait, there's more. What if today was your last day on earth? Would you be ready to meet your maker? Well, Jesus Christ has given us the good news. He told his disciples in Mark 16, 15, 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus Christ has instructed his children to share and preach the gospel, which is the good news, which means that Jesus Christ came and that he was sacrificed. He was buried and he rose on the third day by believing and by repenting and confessing and being baptized. You will be saved. So it is your choice. Jesus Christ will not force you. You've heard the message. You heard personal testimonies. 
But this is your opportunity to give your life to Christ. Don't wait until tomorrow, because tomorrow is not promised. So I hope you submit to the will of God and give your soul to Christ. Be blessed.